All right, students, we're going um, we're gonna to increase the level of difficulty in this topic a bit with this video. We're going to talk about the kinetic theory of ideal gases. Okay, now you may have heard of uh, ideal gases before in your chemistry and physics courses. Uh, I'm going to dispel some maybe myths that you have about ideal gases, and we're going to talk about specifically uh, what the IB physics curriculum really wants you to understand an ideal gas to be. Okay? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to actually define what an ideal gas is, okay? And remember that one of the uh, sort of underpinning things about this course is that we use um, simplifying assumptions to understand things, and that's the case with physics and all science in general, okay? This is especially the case with gases and um, pressure and thermodynamics, okay? So when we study gases, we treat the gas as what's called an ideal gas. And the entire set of assumptions that I'm about to outline to you is called the kinetic theory of gases or the kinetic model of gases, okay? So we're going to define an ideal gas as a collection of particles, um, each of which has, each collection of which has the following, um, has the follow, following characteristics. The first one is that um, this collection has a mass, but negligible volume. So we don't consider the volume of each individual um, particle when we're dealing with ideal gases, okay? Um, each particle moves randomly in straight lines at a range of speeds until it hits something. Um, each particle does not attract or repel one another, no intermolecular forces. Uh, each particle collides in a perfectly elastic fashion with each other in the walls of container. Um, each of which has a short collision time compared to time between collisions, and each of which obeys Newton's law, which means that energy and momentum would be conserved. Now, the reality is that uh, a collection of gas particles actually doesn't, um, these things are not real, strictly speaking, but it turns out that if we, that if we neglect these, uh, this collection of particles or treat them as such, it turns out that we can use what's called the equation of state or the ideal gas law to actually solve problems um, with, with volumes and um, collections of particles in, in, a, in a very useful way and actually apply uh, the physics to do things useful, which is what we're, which is what we're trying to do. Okay? So remember, the reality is that none of these things actually occurs in real life, but their effects are negligible for our purposes. Okay? All right, a few other things. When we study ideal gases, we also assume that the volume occupied by an ideal gas is the same as the volume of the container, okay? It's a pretty reasonable assumption. There's no reason to think why one corner of a box that contains a gas would be, would be empty and uh, the rest and then the other corner would have all the gas molecules bunched up in it. That's just not going to happen, okay? We also assume that the pressure exerted by an ideal gas corresponds to the number of collisions the particles make on the walls of the container in a given time, and that the temperature, of course, is proportional to the average kinetic energy. Okay? All right, so I'm going to make use, so we're going to make use of FET simulations quite a bit um, in this section. Okay? So here I have a collection of gas, uh, gas particles at a certain pressure and a certain temperature. Okay? Um, so there's lots of different things that I can actually change about this, right? So if I wanted to change the volume, I could actually push this top down or lift it out or whatever. I could actually add more gas molecules to this, um, to it. Um, I could do lots of things, but we're, we're going to get to that later. So, but, but, but this is what the ideal gas, the kinetic theory, we're assuming a set of particles that look something like this. They're obviously moving so fast you wouldn't even be able to see them. Um, and there's also a lot more particles in this chamber than we're showing, but you get the idea of how we're going to actually depict this. Okay? It's important for you to also note that a real gas approximate, approximates an ideal gas only under the following conditions. When the pressure is relatively low, when the temperature is relatively moderate and the density is relatively low. And um, so when we use the ideal gas law and deal with all these problems, we're going to always assume that this, this we're always going to assume that, that these things are true. Okay. Okay. You may have heard about the concept of pressure. Um, we've talked about pressure a little bit. Whenever you have a force per unit area, um, this is what's referred to in physics as pressure, okay? The SI units of pressure are obviously newtons per square meter. Um, and what's important about this to note here that maybe you don't know before is that it's the force applied perpendicularly to the surface of an object per unit area, okay? Um, now, in the case of a gas, 
The pressure comes from collisions of molecules with the walls of the container. So now P is, is related to the kinetic energy of the molecules, which is also related uh, to T, right? And it turns out that PV equals NRT. Okay, this is the ideal gas law, which we're going to talk about uh, more formally in a little bit. Okay, so my question to you is I have this chamber filled with gas. How do I increase the pressure? What are some things that I could do to increase the pressure? Okay, well, obviously, because pressure uh, pressure is defined as the, the, uh, the number of collisions of molecules with the walls of the container, if I change the volume, right, um, if I decrease the volume, then wouldn't there be more collisions with the walls of the container? Definitely. Um, if I were to add more molecules to that chamber, wouldn't that also increase the pressure? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> so somehow we're going to have to um, also increase the average um, the average speed of the molecules. Okay. Um, this can also mean that we could increase the temperature. All three of these. Uh, variables, pressure, volume, and temperature, are all intimately related. So you should be getting an idea of that just by watching this demo. Okay. Um, so again, if we decrease, if we decrease the volume, we're going to increase the pressure. Okay. But if the temperature stabilizes, then some other things happen too. Right. So you see how that you see how the molecules are moving faster. Um, which means that the collisions, the number of collisions increases, but also the temperature increases. We're going to get we're going to get into all this stuff in much more detail in the next video. Okay, all right. So a little bit more on the concept of pressure. When I say that it's a force applied perpendicularly to the surface of an object per unit area, what I really mean is that it's f cosine theta over the area, where theta is the angle between the surface normal and the force. Remember when we studied. Um, dynamics or uh, statics and Newton's laws and so forth and we talked about perpendicular forces and so forth okay um, so again the SI units are Newtons per square meter that's a Pascal and I want you to know that there's another very common um, when we're talking about gases there's another common unit and that is an atmosphere and what an atmosphere is is it's the pressure um, is it's the average pressure at sea level on the surface of the earth and that's about one times ten to the fifth pascals okay all right so again here's your uh, unit normal vector here's your force coming in so the component that's acting perpendicularly is f cosine theta okay all right so you can see that that all these little red vectors are actually not the force vectors but they're the f cosine theta or the perpendicular component of the force vectors to the walls of the container okay so here's the equation um, where we have our, my unit normal vector and P and A as scalars, okay? So what this means is that you can reduce the pressure by either reducing the force or increasing the area. So like in, in the case of traveling across snow, if you want to um, not what they call post hole while walking across a snowy field, you'd need snowshoes. And what do snowshoes do? Snowshoes increase the area uh, over which the force is um, applied to the surface of the snow so there's less pressure, so you're less likely to sink. Um, rabbits, the evolution of rabbits, takes this, take this, takes this into account. A snowshoe rabbit, for example, has really big feet, and that's the reason why. Okay, so first example, uh, why don't you go ahead and try this one on your own? Very simple example. Okay, so I have a 65 kg woman balancing on the heel of her right shoe. I give you the circular, I'm making it simple, a circular base of one centimeter. How much pressure does she exert on the ground? That's her weight over the area, um, which is 2 times 10 to the 6 pascals. That's a lot of pressure, right? Okay, this one's a little bit more difficult. Try example 2 on your own. This will take you a few minutes to do this one. Okay, okay, so let me just walk you through this particular one. Okay, so the weight of a car is obviously equally supported by all four tires. What's the, what they call the gauge pressure. So when you look on the side of a tire, it says, you know, maximum maximum um, pressure in this tire when you're pumping it up. That's the gauge pressure, okay? So that's 2, point, uh, two times 10 to the fifth Pascal. And each tire has an area of 140 square centimeters in contact with the ground, which is the lower part of that tire right here. Okay, and I'm asking you, what's the mass of the car? Well, the air pressure in the tire... Um, is equal to force over area, and force is equal to pressure times area. Each tire supports a weight, um, a weight of W equals mg equals P times A, okay, um, of 2,800 newtons, okay. The total weight of the car is obviously four times that because these numbers refer to one particular tire. So the mass of the car 
would be 1,142 kilograms, or about 1,100 kilograms, okay, which is about right. Okay? So again, the key to this when you're dealing with bicycles and um, cars is to deal with a factor of 2 or a factor of 4 when you're dealing with tire pressure. Okay, I'm getting into uh, now another topic which I'm sure that you've covered uh, at some point in, chem in your chemistry class. Um, so I'm going to make some assumptions that you've seen moles and Avogadro's, the concept of moles and Avogadro's constant before. Remember that the mole is simply another unit of measure, which is the amount of substance that contains the same number of elementary units as there are atoms in 12 grams of carbon-12. Okay, this is called Avogadro's number. Why do we pick carbon-12? Because carbon-12 is a very common uh, element uh, an isotope of carbon on, on this planet where we live, okay? Turns out that this number is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. So if I have one mole of golf balls, I have 6 times 10 to the 23rd golf balls, okay? That's all that means, okay? Another example, here's an example using moles, okay? Um, if the number of observable galaxies is on the order of 10 to the 14, and each galaxy contains 10 to the 11 stars, how many stars are there? Well, obviously it's 10 to the 25th, okay? But how many moles are there? How many moles of stars? Well, if one mole is about 10 to the 24th, nearest order of magnitude, would this be greater than or less than one mole? Will it be greater than one mole? It's about 16.6 .6 moles when you use the bridge method to work this out. Okay, now we're going to get a little bit deeper into this. IB physics requires you to be uh, to know this uh, in a little more refined fashion than you did in your grade 9 or grade 10 um, chemistry class. We're going to call the mass of one mole of a substance the molar mass. And in physics, we use either lowercase um, mu, uh, Greek letter mu, or capital M. It's sometimes also called the atomic mass. So, for example, the molar mass of a carbon-12 atom is 12 grams per mole. And what that means is that 12 grams of this particular kind of atom contains exactly 6 times 10 to the 23rd atoms, okay? Molar mass of sodium, okay? And I'm showing these uh, elements as they appear on the periodic table, okay? It's 23 grams per mole. It means that 23 grams of sodium contains that many Avogadro's number of atoms and so forth. Oxygen, okay? If it's a diatomic molecule, you need this factor of 2 out in front. That's very important. Molar mass of carbon dioxide, uh, it's 1 times that of C and 2 times that of O, okay? Study this last example carefully, okay? So it means that uh, 44 grams of carbon dioxide has exactly, is exactly 1 mole of those molecules, okay? Now, uh, you guys have all hopefully um, been exposed to the periodic table uh, to some degree, okay? What do the numbers mean on the periodic table? Well, the number that's on top, which is which refers to the way uh, the, the order in which the elements are shown, is the atomic number. The one on the bottom that often has a decimal but is close to an integer is called the atomic mass. And the atomic number is also called the proton number. And it's the number of protons in the nucleus. And remember that it's the number of protons in the nucleus that determines what the element is. Okay? The atomic mass is the number of nucleons. And this term nucleons refers to the number of protons and neutrons together. Therefore, we can infer what the number of neutrons is if we know these two numbers. Okay? <coughs> the atomic mass is not an integer because it's really derived from the average masses of all the isotopes of an atom, which you, hopefully you know, okay? Okay, so I'm going to let big N equal the total number of molecules in a substance. Little n is the number of moles. This will be important for you to understand and, re and remember that this is little n as number of moles. N sub A is Avogadro's number. Then clearly, and you can work out the units here if you want, okay, the number of moles of a substance is big N divided by N sub A. Okay, and if I let little m be the mass in grams of a substance and mu equal the molar mass of a substance, then it must be that little m is n times mu. Okay, so you want to make sure, work this out and make sure that you, um, you see the logic in that. Okay, and now we're going to work a few um, examples, which should be straightforward for you. Go ahead and try this one. Okay, the mass of one carbon-12 atom. Okay, I got about 2 times 10 to the minus 23rd grams. The number of moles of 24 grams, well, it's 2 since 12 grams is 1 mole. The number of moles of 8 grams, well, that's 2 thirds of a mole, okay? And the mass of, of 3 times 10 to the 24 carbon-12 atoms, I'm using the bridge method here, and I got 59.9 grams. Okay, a couple more examples. How many molecules are in 10 grams of carbon dioxide? How would you do that one? Try that one, and then try example 6. Okay, so for example 5, 
I'm just using, you know, you can either, you can use these equations if you want. You can use the simple bridge method. It doesn't matter to me uh, as long as it makes sense to you. For this one, I got about 1.4 times 10 to the 23rd molecules and 10 grams of carbon dioxide. And in example six, I got 638 grams um, in an, an amount of oxygen containing that many molecules. And another example, try this one for copper. So the mass of one atom of copper, okay, again, uh, re remember your problem solving skills uh, and, and being able to tell whether your answer makes sense. You want something very, very, very small here, right? Okay, uh, and in fact, you get one times 10 to the minus 22 grams. The number of copper atoms in one cubic meter, that's going to be really, really, really big. That's about nine times 10 to the 28 atoms. Remember, one cubic meter is pretty big, 